Have a seat. Oh, what a great sight to see all of us guys together. Amen. It's just a great, great thing. And thank you, Mark, for that great introduction. And so many people's lives have been changed over the years. I see quite a few of you, right, Keith? A lot of people. But uh, a lot of lives are still being changed. And so I thank you for coming. And if you could turn me on the platform just a little bit there, Aaron. And so we're going to dig into um, some things. That, this whole weekend is going to be about you and preparing you to attack the year, get ready for the year. It's already started. You know it's going fast. But uh, God's got things to do. You are in a... Uh, the world's changing. It needs light. And it, it's, it's hungry for the things of God, the real things of God. Not religion, not church buildings, the power of God. But uh, I'm going to give you a couple points that we need to talk about. I think most of you know my story. Total chaos, debt, antidepressants, panic attacks for nine years. Uh, really hopeless. Uh, yet born again, spirit-filled, love church, love the anointing but uh, could not see how to get what the Bible said in my life. You know, I could learn it, I, had to, uh, I could quote it, but I couldn't quite get it to manifest. Anyone else ever been there? Yeah, well, how many know that's not how it's supposed to work? Amen. It's because a lot of the religious teaching we've had that uh, has hindered us to receive. So we need to kind of jump in that and kind of retrain our brains. But I want to mark this down. We're going to talk about this. Number one, these are some steps, so take notes. Number one, if you want to get ahead with God, you've got to stop the chaos. You know, the Bible says that God's voice is that still, quiet voice. You know, Jesus had to get away to a, what? Quiet place. But when things are chaotic and things are, in chaos, you know, it's sometimes hard to hear. And I was living a life of chaos, and you might be as well. So number one, we got to stop the chaos, and you need to understand how that works. About three weeks ago, I had a, a dream in the night about a young lady that sings on our platform that uh, in the dream, she had cancer. And I didn't know that, but in the dream, she had cancer. And in the dream, I laid my hands on her, and God showed me how to deal with that. And I thought, well, should I call her, you know, because God, I knew, it, I knew what to do. I knew what to do, but should I call her? Should I? And I really felt in my spirit, don't call her. Now, she goes to over our PAL campus, so I didn't see her very often. And uh, so that's three weeks ago. And so this Saturday night, I didn't know she was here, but I was on the front row and we were in worship. The anointing of God was strong. And all of a sudden I had this urgency in my spirit that I was to pray for people to pray against cancer. So I came up front and I said, hey, anyone have cancer, been diagnosed with cancer? I'd like you to come up front. And uh, here comes this young lady. I didn't know she's even here. She comes around here. She comes up front. And so I, I knew exactly what to do because I'd already seen it. God showed me exactly what to do. So I want to help you understand, but here's, here's what he said to do. He said, you go up and lay your hands on her and you say these words. I'm just, these are the exact words he said to say to her. He said, get out, get out. No, you don't get out of here. Get out. That's what he said. You got to stop the chaos. The enemy's going to take you on a ride. He wants to keep you in chaos. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy, and you have to stop him. And you'll have to know how to do that. So I appreciate the Holy Spirit showing me how to do that with her. And so that was pretty amazing to watch God, how he works. But uh, Acts chapter 22, turn there in your Bibles, because I'm sure there's things in your life you need to get out. And you need to change. Now, obviously... The Bible says truth is what sets you free. So obviously truth is necessary to walk in freedom, but you also need to be able to recognize what the enemy's doing, you know, what you're doing, and to separate that, you need to be able to discern. Uh, that's what Romans chapter 12 says, to no longer be conformed to the uh, pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you can test and approve what God's perfect will is for your life. You gotta know what to say yes to, what to say no to. But so spiritually, the enemy, the enemy jumps in behind lies. He jumps in. He's a, the father of lies. He tries to get you to believe a lie, which gives him jurisdiction. And so you have to be able to discern truth to walk free. But he comes in behind that. 
And he brings bondage and oppression and disease and problems. And it's going to come in the door of, of what the Bible says, doctrine of demons. Doctrine of demons is anything that's opposed to what God says is right. So you must become a student of the kingdom. You must know what the kingdom says. So you must know the laws of the kingdom. You must learn what is legal and your position in the kingdom, and your position of spiritual authority in the kingdom, and how to deal with spiritual oppression and sickness and disease and poverty. Anything that's not in heaven is not right. You have to know how to handle it. Otherwise, it'll handle you, right? Acts chapter 22, one of my favorite pictures. This is about Paul. The crowd, this is verse 22 of chapter 22. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. He was talking about accepting the Gentiles into the kingdom. The Jews didn't like that. Then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust in the air, the commander ordered Paul to be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and questioned in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like that. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, a phrase you must know how to handle. What is the phrase? Is it legal? Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do, he said. This man's a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? He said, yes, I am. The commander said, I have had to pay a big price for my citizenship. Paul says, I was born a citizen. Those who are about to question Paul, what? What does it say? They withdrew how fast? Immediately. Immediately the commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. Now, this is a perfect example of how you need to handle the enemy. But you must know if it's legal. So you must know what's legal. But once you know what's legal, you need to take a stand against him and tell him to back off. And the Bible says he runs in terror. The Bible says submit to God, resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Flee is the Greek word meaning terror. He runs in terror. This commander was nervous. He illegally was going to flog and chain Paul, even though he had not been tried and found guilty in a court of law. Now, this is how the, this is how the enemy operates. He finds lack of knowledge, tries to convince you he has a legal right, shows you no way out, brings up your past, brings up your whatever it is. He will try to condemn you every turn. And unless you know where you stand in Christ, you're going to take a trip you don't want to pay for take a trip you don't want to pay for. This is so cool how this turns out now. Looking at chapter 23, verse 12. So the next morning, we're still with Paul here. The Jews formed a conspiracy. They said, okay, this guy's not going to flog this guy. We got to get rid of this guy. We have to get rid of Paul. So they formed about 40 of them, got together and said, we're not going to eat or drink until we kill him. All right. So we turn the page over here. Same chapter, 23. We find that a young man heard the plan, heard, heard about this, okay? So this young man went and told the commander what he had heard about this plan to kill Paul. Then in verse 23, this is important, 23, the commander calls two of his centurions and ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers. See, a centurion has 100 soldiers. Two centurions is 200 soldiers. 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight and provide a mount for Paul so he may be taken what? How? Safely, Safely to Governor Felix. Now, here's the same people that were going to fog him are now concerned about his safety giving him a mount to ride all the way to the court. And 470 soldiers to protect him on his way. Can you imagine what happens in the spirit realm? When you say, back off, back off, the other demons say, oh, no, and the other demons say, you can't, you can't touch him. 
And that's what happened. The same soldiers that were trying to flog him are now saying back off. Is that right? The same soldiers, same commander that said flog him are now saying back off. Satan has to back off. And he gets there in safety. And he went to court. See, you live in a legal system, friend. The kingdom of God is a legal system. It's a government. And you need to know how it operates legally. Your salvation is a legal issue. It's not a feeling issue. I've told you that many times. It's a legal issue. And you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. You have legal rights. You need to know those rights. Satan is trying all he can to keep that hidden from you so that you, you don't know what your rights are and he can continue to kill, steal, and destroy and steal everything God has given you and what he wants to do in your life. But you must know how to stop him. It's interesting. How many have heard of Lester Summerall? Yeah, he's in heaven now, but we grew up hearing him preach, uh, knew him in, in a sense, not in a great close way, but knew him and heard him preach many, many times. He tells of the time when he was in Central America and he cast a demon out of a witch doctor. Laying his hands upon that witch doctor, he said to come out. Witch doctor flopped over in the ground, stood back up praying in tongues and born again. But later that night, Lester tells the story. He went to bed that night, and it was a hot night. He opened the window of his hut there in Central America. No air conditioning back then. The room began to fill with a horrible smell. It got cold in the room. All of a sudden, and I'm going to quote now. I'm going to read. Suddenly, the heat of the night disappeared from the room. A damp chill filled the place. It was so cold, Dr. Summerall began to shiver. A wind began to blow, the curtains wildly on their rods. Then the bed began to shake so violently that it moved all the way out into the middle of the floor. Well, Dr. Summerall had enough of this. He raised up on his bed and said, You demon spirit, I recognize you. I cast you out earlier today. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get out. Immediately, the evil presence left the room. The heat returned. The curtains laid down against the wall. The bed stopped shaking. The odor left the room. But that wasn't what happened next. Instead, he thought a moment and then sat back up in the bed, looked out the window and shouted, Hey, devil, get back in here. <laughs> the curtains began to shake. The wind rushed in. The coldness returned, the smell returned, the bed began to shake violently and almost shook him out of the bed. Dr. Summerall said, devil, when I came into this room, my bed was up against that wall. Now in the name of Jesus, put it back. The, began, the, bed, the bed began to shake and shook clear across the room till it sat exactly where it was and he walked in the room. Today, you know, most Christians think it's a great victory if they stop the devil. It's a great victory if we stop, and then they, you know, stop. But they need to take it one step further and realize where that bed's supposed to be at, what that life's supposed to look like, what the devil tried to steal from you. And you know, it's, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing to say, you know, come out, but hey, what were you taking? Put it back, Right? We need to know how to handle the devil and think differently about this situation. Luke chapter 13 gives us an example. You've read this before. Verse 10, Jesus on a Sabbath day teaching. A woman is there had been crippled by the spirit, a spirit for 18 years. 18 years. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. He put his hands on her and she was immediately healed. The uh, synagogue leaders were indignant because he did that on the Sabbath day. And Jesus said, you hypocrites. Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall, lead it out and give it water? That should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day? See, it was a legal issue. She was already legally uh, a daughter of Abraham. She already had the legal right to be healed. Jesus said, why shouldn't she be healed? She's a daughter of Abraham. It's legal. Everyone say, it's legal. It's legal. It's legal. It's legal. 
it's legal for her to be healed. It's a legal issue. Now, how did Satan keep her bound for 18 years then? No one knew the law. The Pharisees, religion, had convinced her probably that it was God's will. Until Jesus showed up, praise God, <laughs> and said, come out, you know, come out of here. And she was instantly healed. This was a legal case. Yours is a legal case as well. Psalms 103.2 says this, praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Read the instructions, friend. Remember what the instructions say. Remember the benefits, right? What does the Bible say? How many promises are there? They're very clear. They're already yours. Forget not the benefits. He heals all your diseases, forgives all your sins, right? It's amazing. He redeems your life from the pit. He brought you out from under Satan's jurisdiction. Understand where you stand legally. You are seated with Christ in heavenly places. You have his name, his authority, and his assignment, his anointing. You don't have to sit there and take it. You need to know who you are. And those who know you need to know that you know who you are because they need to understand that you can help them as well receive freedom, right? So stop the chaos. I tell this story back way back when I was just beginning to learn how the kingdom operated. My van burned up. I won't tell the story, but it burned up. The insurance agent calls and said, Mr. Cassie, yeah, it's totaled, and here's the check we're going to give you. I had just happened to be viewing the policy that day, and I noticed that if it burned by fire, there was no deductible. But the agent said, well, after the deductible, we'll give you a check for this amount. I said, uh, excuse me? On page 8, subparagraph E, section 5, sentence 6, word 3, you know, it says that if this thing burns by fire, you pay me the entire amount, no deductible. Are you expecting the insurance company to point that out? Are you expecting the devil to point it out? No, friend, you have to know your legal rights. You have to know what to say in that situation for what you say in that situation determines your future and the bill you're going to pay. Mm -hmm. You see, stopping the devil is only part of the equation. But so many Christians, that's what they get excited about, stopping the devil, stopping the devil. Well, there's a whole lot more than stopping the devil because he's trying to keep something from you. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus says in verse 19, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. That's the authority of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth, heaven backs up. Whatever you loose on earth, heaven backs up. Now, we've talked about binding the devil, stopping him from stealing, killing, and destroying. But how do we loose heaven? Now, this is where I found that a lot of the church doesn't know how to step into that. We can go, Jesus, 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 you know. <clears throat> we can have a little success there. But unless we know what it's supposed to look like, we won't tell the devil to put it back. We'll just lick our wounds and say, well, we stopped him, but he still ran off with some stuff you're supposed to have. So how do you lose heaven? How do we bring heaven into the earth realm? Of course, faith is required. I don't have time to teach faith. Faith is required to make it legal for heaven to invade earth. As you know, and you learned my, stud, my, my teaching, the kingdom of God gave the man, uh, the, the earth realm, gave it to Adam to rule over. People have the jurisdiction in the earth realm. God has to work through people who have the legal jurisdiction here. And so Satan's always trying to pervert God's character and to hide the truth of who you are in Christ, the authority that you have in, in this realm. First off, who holds the keys to do that? Say it again. You do. You have the keys. If you don't turn the key, the key's not going, right? The car's not going anywhere. Even though you own the keys, have the title, you're not going anywhere unless you learn how to drive the Corvette. You can't drive the Corvette till you start. You've got to have the keys. So many believers don't have a clue where the key's at, or there even is a key. As I say in my teaching, the switch, they don't know how to turn the lights on. They don't know there is a switch, never knew there was a switch, have no clue where it's at, how to turn it on. And when it doesn't show up, they, they blame God for it. 
but I guess it must be God's will that, you know, so-and-so died. I believe I, it must have been God. I mean, he has the power. Well, the power company has the power. But unless you turn the switch on, the lights aren't coming on. That's in your jurisdiction. But you know what? You had to learn about a switch. Babies aren't born with the knowledge that there's a switch that turns lights on. You had to learn about lights. And you already know that lights can be duplicated anywhere in the world that anyone follows the laws that govern lights. It's not a choice of if they're good or bad or anything. like. It's a, it's a law. You understand how to put those wires together and create the electricity, and you, have the, you turn the switch on and the bulb works, you'll have light anywhere, 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 for anyone. And the kingdom works exactly the same way. Get out of this mindset that you have to feel the anointing. You have to feel that you're saved. You got to forget it. This is a legal issue, friend. It's law. And you must know how to stand on the law and how to speak the law and tell the devil to shut up and loose what heaven says about your life. Because unless you do, nothing's going to change. But you now, most Christians kind of filter what they say through their perception of what they have, what they see happening, you know, what their bank account says in it, what their body says. They filter, you know, they're not, they don't, they, they feel uncomfortable speaking what heaven says unless they see it. And this is backwards. Tonight, I need you to understand what and how this works. So in Galatians chapter 4 is the best example of how this works. And we need to spend just a little bit of time here. So verse 21, chapter 4, it says, Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. Which one sounds best so far? Free, right. His son by the slave woman was born in what kind of way? Ordinary way. The ordinary way. But his son by the free woman was born as a result of a... Now, this is absolutely essential that you understand this. It was totally impossible for Sarah to have kids. So you need to explain to me how Isaac got here. If you can't explain how Isaac got here, your Isaac, whatever promise you're trying to get in your life is not going to show up either. I tell you to be a spiritual scientist, I always say if you can't teach it, you can't live it. You need to be able to explain how did Isaac get here. And you know what people say? Well, God did it. No, but he went through a man. It wasn't legal in the earth realm for that to happen unless a man opened the door to heaven to do it. So tell me how he did it. Tell me how you can do it. You must know these answers. So how was Isaac conceived if it was impossible? By a, it says, by a promise. Not just a promise that you can mentally uh, agree with. We'll find out a promise that Abraham actually believed. The ordinary way or the free way. Now, dropping down to 28, now you brothers like Isaac are children of promise. At that time, the son born in the ordinary way persecuted the son born by the what? Power of the spirit. You have a choice. The ordinary way is nine months, has labor attached to it, delivery attached to it, or you have now a system of born by the power of the spirit. And it's pretty amazing What does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the what? Underline that word. Underline that word. Look at verse 27. Be glad, O barren woman who bears no children. Break forth and cry aloud. You have no labor pains, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband or the ordinary way. How much labor do you have to put into receiving an inheritance? How much? Zero. Zero. Whose will is it? Whose who's purpose that you receive that inheritance, the receiver or the one giving it? All you have to do is, is accept it. A few legal things you've got to sign off on, but it's, all, it's already yours. Is that right? How much of it? You're, it's all yours. Now notice the Bible says there's the ordinary way, the slave way, the, the earth realm way, the labor way, doing it your way, the hard way, and there's the inheritance way, the free way. 
received by a promise. <laughs> Which one sounds better? You think God has more than you have? And he says he's going to give you inheritance of the entire kingdom. Would you like that? Everything in the kingdom, all the kingdom. Do you know the Bible says you're a co-heir with Christ? Did you know that everything Jesus has is yours as well? Do you know the Bible says he's your brother? You belong to the same family, the same inheritance. So the Bible says, Ephesians 2.19 says, you are a citizen of this kingdom and a member of the family. A member of the family has the inheritance. A citizen has the legal rights of the kingdom, the citizenship. You need to know how that affects your life in both ways. All right, so Isaac has been born by a promise and by the power of the Holy Spirit. So how much work was involved for Sarah and Abraham to do to make that happen in that sense? There's no labor. I mean, they had to receive it. Remember, it was impossible to have kids. It was impossible. They had to receive that promise. They had to receive the promise, all right? The inheritance. How do you think your future is going to be birthed in your life? Did you know that every single thing you receive from God must be birthed in your spirit first? Meaning the picture of it has to come and that you believe it's yours? So what does a promise do? A promise carries with it a what? A picture. If I said, I promise you $1,000 tonight, I'm going to give you a $100 bill, you would picture it, you would imagine, because you trust me, you would imagine that you have that, you'd get it, right? And you can see it. You know what a $100 bill looks like. You can see it. Or if I said, I'm going to give you a green Volkswagen Beetle, you would see a green, you know, you can see it, all right? So the, a promise carries a picture with it. Now, the picture you currently have in your spirit is holding you in a certain place. If you see yourself broke or sick, that's, that's where you're at. So how do we change that picture on the inside of us? How does it happen every payday? Someone gives you a, a check, right? That's a promissory note. So the picture changes on the inside when someone you trust gives you a promise of, of something they wanna give you, is that right? So it, it carries with it a picture. So Isaac was received by the power of a promise, a picture that Abraham carried, that God said he'd be, he would have heirs, that he'd have a son, and Abraham believed that it was possible because God said it. He carried that picture on the inside, incubating it. Now, the word of God is compared many times in the Bible as a seed, so heaven is going to release the word into the earth realm, into the hearts of people where it incubates and produces faith. When their spirit comes into agreement with what heaven says, that's called faith. Remember the one example in Mark chapter four, it says the seed's the smallest, one of the smallest, if not the smallest seed planted in the garden, but after a while it grows and becomes the largest, which shades the entire garden, which means you once couldn't see the seed, but now all you see is the tree. You close your eyes, all you can see is that tree. You know, it's one of the, it's the smallest. You see all the weeds. You see all the problem. You see the grass and the garden. Nothing in the garden worth whatever, you know, it's, it's a worthless garden. You plant this seed. You come back. And eventually that seed, if you keep it there, all by itself it grows and it becomes the largest thing visible so much that it produces rest for the birds and there's peace there. So here's a test. If you're in faith, close your eyes. What do you see? Close your eyes. What do you see? If you cannot see what the promise says, you're not in faith yet. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for, picture, and the evidence of things not seen. You say, well, Pastor Gary, I, I can't, I don't, all I see is this chaos. I mean, you, know, you talk about stopping the devil, but I mean, how do I change this picture on the inside of me? You got to put a new seed in there. And you got to keep it there because all by itself, you have a spirit. Your spirit is designed to incubate whatever you put in it. Now, the enemy knows this. This is how you're created. This is why you'll go see a movie and you'll have one 
blip little scene of something that's, you know, totally perverted. And you may have walked out like I used to. Why would they put that scene in the movie? Friend, this is how the enemy works. He's interested in planting a seed. It's just how your spirit operates. This is how you were made. What you put in there is going to be incubated. And if you keep it there, you'll eventually carry it out. In fact, James says that a desire will drag you into it to, to fulfill it, drag you to fulfill it. The desire in your spirit, if you keep meditating on it, will drag you to fulfill that picture. So you have to be careful what you put in your spirit. David said, I'll not put anything evil in front of my eyes. You have to choose to what are you going to allow the picture of to enter into your spirit because you're going to duplicate that. Your spirit is going to incubate that. It's going to get larger and eventually drag your life that direction. All right, so if I want to change something, so you say, Pastor, I don't have a future. I mean, you talk about success. You talk about healing. What, how do I get what heaven says? Well, you got to take the seed, the word. Mark chapter 4 talks about that. You put that in your spirit. You keep it there. You meditate on it day and night. You keep it in front of you. You read it. You think about it. Keep it before your eyes. You've heard stories, you know, my daughter, when she had that 13-pound tumor, she had scriptures all over her mirror, all over her bedroom, you know, so that every time she opened her eyes in the night, first thing in the morning, she saw that picture. She saw that picture. When we were first uh, married back in Tulsa, Drenda was pregnant. She put scriptures all over the ceiling above our bed. So when she woke up, the first thing she saw was those promises. And she almost miscarried Tom. She woke up with bleeding and pain in the morning, and she glanced up and saw those scriptures. And she said, thank you, Jesus. He's going to live and not die. And she almost miscarried. But she made a practice of looking at that picture. So what you put in your spirit is going to be reproduced. You're going to, it's an incubation system. Your spirit incubates whatever you put in there. This is, the, this is not complicated. All the success books you read are tapping into this principle. Napoleon Hill, think and grow rich. It's all he, you take something, you think about it three times a day, you meditate on it, and it begins to move you towards success. This, is, this principle is all success, success books are all based on this principle on your spirit, how God designed you to function. You put a picture of God's word, the promise in your spirit, it begins, it carries a picture with it. So Isaac was born as a result of a promise. Your prosperity, your healing, you can name whatever it is, is going to be born in your life. You're going to produce it, incubate it in your spirit. That is the first part of it. You have to plant a seed. You got to have a baby. You got to get the seed into your spirit so it changes the picture. And here is the part that you must understand. When you plant a garden, who picks what's planted? You do. What role does the dirt play? I mean, it holds the seed in place, provides nutrients, water, holds it in place for the sunlight. But the dirt has nothing to say of what's produced. Is that right? So let's say that you have no success. You're in debt, seriously in debt. How would you handle that? Now, here's what I believe. And I, I, tell, I say this all the time. You don't need a begging mentality, a survival mentality. Who can help me? I need to find money. You don't need to find money. You need to create money. God is, uh, he, he changes destinies, man. He, he's into the income streams. Yeah. Nothing wrong with a short, you know, temporary cash influx to, you know, meet a bill, but that's not going to change your life. Yeah. But a garden will, because it'll produce more seeds. You can plant those, you can eat it, and it, you can change your whole destiny. So what would you do if you have no talent no ability compared to today's culture, cannot see any way at all that you'd be able to make $400,000, $600,000 a year, a million dollars a year, 
and you would, you would put that equation up, the T-bar, and you'd say, I need to make 600, and you put yourself over there, and you go, what happens? Hmm? Come on. You can't see the picture, can you? You cannot see it. And so you need to understand this. Until you can see it, it's not showing up. It's not showing up. You can wish it shows up. You can try to, try to force it. You, you, it'll not show up. I had this problem with my plane. I mean, there's a lot of planes, right? They're expensive. I have two planes. I have a Piper Warrior, which is a four-seat, most of you know, it's a trainer. But I needed a plane that I could fly in business. I, didn't want to, I did not want a jet at that time because I wasn't rated in a jet. I wanted to be able to fly the plane. So what, how, how's the plane going to show up? Now, I already knew enough about how this works. I already knew until I said, that's it, it wasn't coming. Until I saw the picture and I go, that's the plane right there, that one right there. Let me just deviate for a second. Back in, I love motorcycles as well. And back in history, I couldn't afford a motorcycle, but I began to sew towards one. We had pastors come through. I'd give them a check. This is for your motorcycle. Or this is the gas for your riding this. And I put on that check for a, a Honda ST1100. That was the model I wanted. I put every check. I'd give them, I'd buy, you know, used bikes for people. I'd buy gasoline. I, but I said this, I don't want this bike until I have a garage because I was living in an old house, you know. I wanted, I wanted a new one. I wanted to make sure it could be taken care of. So I said, I don't want it until I have a garage. So we built our, our house. And uh, some people surprised me and they brought, brought me a brand new ST. It was 1,300 at the time, 1,100 had moved up, just engine size, same bike, 1,300. I could name probably tons of examples like that, but this plane now, I needed a plane and so I couldn't see it. I said, here's how I prayed. Now, there are probably things you know you need, right? But you can't see yourself with it. I mean, you can't, you can see it, you see you and you put them together and you can't quite, yes, I have it. Until you say, yes, I have it. It's not showing up. So I said, Lord, you got to help me with this. There's a lot of different planes out there. I said, I need, I need you to help me with the picture. I mean, what plane, I need you to show me what plane, help me with the picture. I have a guy in my church they do three Sunday services. He left church at the end of the first service, was driving home, and the Lord said, you turn around and go back to the second service, and you have a picture of a plane your boss bought. I want you to take your phone up to him at the end of the second service and just show him the picture of that plane. So he comes up after service and says, Pastor Gary says, yeah, this is kind of crazy. I, I was already almost home and God said to come back to church and I was supposed to show you this plane. He didn't know I was looking for a plane. He said, God said to show you this picture. And it was a Piper Mirage. Now you would think I would have seen one. I, you know, I didn't know much about planes at that level, you know. I mean, I looked at different planes, and they have, they have, Piper has several planes, the turbines, and, you know, different types of planes. But I'd never seen the Piper Mirage. I said, wait a minute. I said, wait a minute. Let me see that. That's a Piper? It's not a jet. That's a, that's a turbocharged, high-pressurized, you know, and it's uh, pressurized, so you can go 25,000 feet. I said, how fast is it? 250 miles an hour. I said, uh, that's it. I said, that's it. I had it within three weeks. I had that plane in three weeks. So the first thing you want to do is you have to get that seed, the promise. And you got to meditate on that thing because I, Isaac was conceived by the result of a promise. Everything you receive from God will come as a result of a promise. It'll be conceived in your spirit. But here's the thing I want to tell you. You got to get this straight. Your heart is the ground. So let's, let's review again. I can't see myself with a picture. You got to grow it. You have to grow it. You have to hold on to it. 
The Bible says the word is sown into the spirit of man, and then it first is a blade, then a stalk, then the head in the stalk, then the seed in the head, and then when the seed matures, then you put the sickle in and capture the harvest. You got to grow it. You got to hold on to it. You have to be fully persuaded that it's God's word says it's yours. You have to hold on to that. You, can, you may not even see anything about it. But here's the thing. Don't look at the dirt. Look at the promise. And this is the sentence that God said. You've got to tell the guys, don't look at the dirt. There's farmers in my church that plow thousands of acres. They throw hundreds of thousands of dollars into the dirt every year. And they're not crying about it either. In fact, they're looking for more dirt all the time. They don't see the dirt. They see the picture of the harvest. When they try to sell you seeds in the hardware store, they're in colorful little packets with the mature crop on the front of the packet. That's why you buy it. That's why you plant it, because you're anticipating receiving what that picture says when it's mature. So, the ground is idle. It has nothing to do with the harvest. If that's true, and you're the ground, Mark chapter 4 says, a man scatters the seed in the ground. And Jesus said, the ground's your heart, your spirit. Who decides what to sow? He says, the man sows the word and scatters it. And though he does not know how, day and night, the seed all by itself begins to produce the picture on the inside of that person all by itself. You getting this? Kind of sounds like an inheritance here. I'm not laboring for this thing. I'm receiving it. You see what I'm saying? All by itself, the dirt holds the seed, but the life is in the seed. Get this. You have nothing to do with the seed. See, you have been looking at the dirt your entire life, you, and saying, I have no potential. I can't do that. I couldn't do that. I can't pay for that. Because you're looking at the field that's barren, friend. But you can plant the seed of God's word in that field, which is your heart, your spirit. You can grow anything in that thing. You can grow a house. You can grow a, a marriage. You can grow a car. What do you need? Everything is already yours. The pro 7,000 promises, 7,000 seeds are out there. Just take one of them and believe it. Put it in the ground and leave it there all by itself. You don't have to. It says, though the person has no clue how it's growing, how it's happening, day and night, it is changing on the inside. I mean, how does a seed germinate anyway? They find him in tombs a thousand years old. They put him in water and the thing germinates. Comes back to life. It looks as dead as a doornail. Dried out thing. And it comes to life. And not only comes to life, it produces a harvest. What I'm, God said, listen, you control what is sown. And all by itself, you need to understand, all by itself, the seed produces life. The seed carries the seed. The seed carries the life. This is what i got to get you to understand. It's not based on your checkbook. It's not based on your history. It's not based on who you think you are. It's based on what God says. His seed is sown into you, and it produces after what he says it produces. Now, what does that do about your potential? Come on. What, how does that change your potential? How does that change your life? <laughs> that just opened up the whole, that opened up the whole thing. You mean, it's an inheritance, friend. <clears throat> you don't have to do it in the ordinary way. 20 bucks an hour, 15 bucks, whatever, 30 bucks an hour. I mean, the ordinary, slow, dollar for labor way. Listen, there's a faster way to do stuff. I'm not saying it's wrong to have a job and work. But if you haven't found out, a job by itself doesn't go fast enough. There's things to get done, friend. It, you know, you can't make enough money just by laboring. I mean, when God spoke to Abraham and said, go look at the stars, he was reminding him of his inheritance, which would be all those heirs, more than he could count. He said, you go out and try to count those stars, Abraham. 
let me show you how big your future really is. And Abraham's sitting there, and it's impossible to have kids. I mean, it's impossible. And God's saying, you're going to have so many kids, you can't even count them. But wait a, wait a minute, I can't, we can't have. But the Bible says something very important. Very important. Romans chapter 4, verse 18. Against all hope... Abraham in hope believed, and so he became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. We looked at the stars. Without weakening in his faith, that means agreeing with what God said, he faced the fact his body was as good as dead. Yeah, we can face the fact. We have, that field's empty. Yeah, I don't have any potential. I have no potential. I mean, I don't have the money to pay for that thing. I don't, I, I don't even have the talent to earn enough money to pay for that thing, Right? Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Not what you promised, what he had promised, the seed. That seed is going to produce exactly what that promise is in your life. It's going to, all you have to do, you get in this, all you have to do is hold on to it. The enemy knows that. That's why he's always trying to intimidate you and to cause you to let go of it. Did God really say? Remember the parable of the, the, the seed sower? Some people don't receive it. They're hard soil. I don't believe that. Other people hear the word with joy, the Bible says. But when trouble and persecution comes because of what? Because of the word. See, Satan knows that if that seed stays in the incubation of the earth realm in your spirit, it will produce and nothing can stop it. He has to get you to believe another lie. He has to get you to doubt God's character, that God's not good, that he can't perform. No, he has to intimidate or cause you to, to believe that the problem's bigger than God. So you let go of it and out of your mouth comes, oh, I don't know what we're going to do. How are we going to pay for that? How are we going to do that? He just chopped that plant down. He knew the facts. The Bible says he could look at the facts, but he was yet fully persuaded of what God said. And he held on to that. And all by itself in his spirit. The Bible says Isaac was conceived by a promise. He was conceived by a promise and born by the power of God. Friend, this is your answer. This is absolutely your answer. To dig into the word of God, understand how this works, and say amen. You know, the Bible says all the promises are yes and amen. They're all yes and amen. They're all yes and you have to say amen, so be it. You have to receive it. Like a, the soil receiving a seed, you have to say, I'll take that one. What do you have need of? Why do you want to do without it? That woman was bound for 18 years by Satan. She didn't have to do that. The law already said she could be free. Jesus said, why shouldn't she be free? It's already legal. They were going to flog Paul until he said, this is illegal. You have to know what's legal. You have to know how this thing works. You've got to stop the chaos and plant some seeds in your garden. And then you've got to stay there and meditate and let the word of God produce faith. And that thing shows up. Changing the picture on the inside. Is that good? Let's review. Let's review. You have no potential to do what God says. You can't make enough money fast enough. Your assignment will take more money than you have right now. The place we call destiny, I always say, when you get to your destiny, it'll require you to be able to handle more money than you have right now, require more people than you know right now. So how are you going to do it? Most people are satisfied just to pay the bills. You ask someone, how's your finances? They say, great, define that. Well, Pastor Gary, we paid our bills on time. Yeah, we paid the car payment on time. Got a nice car, got a nice house, paid the house payment on time. Okay, well, tell me how much money you got in the bank then. Uh, $1,000. You can't do anything. You can't do anything. You're a slave. You're saying labor in envelopes every month. You're a slave. Slaves can't do anything interesting. In fact, they don't even think anything interesting. Talk to a slave, what do they want to do? Get off work? 
Slaves don't dream big dreams because in a slave's mind, it all means more work. It does. It all means more work. They don't look for big dreams because it means more work. They're already worked as hard as they can work. No, what you need is a Holy Spirit strategy and idea. How do you get that? Sow the seed. You know the story. My wife and I, we were in debt. I mean, seriously in debt. Nine years, hopelessly messed up in debt. How do we become millionaires? If I was that good, I would have done it back then. Right? I mean, really, I used to dream about what it would feel like to have $100 that I didn't know anyone. And I couldn't even see that. I couldn't see it. Couldn't see it. What did God have to do? He had to change my thinking. He had to show me how the kingdom worked. He had changed my picture, showed me how the word works. I had to receive that word. I had to receive that seed that it was possible. I had to hold on to it. Then he began, I began to see, he began to show me pictures. He gave me a dream to start a company. That company's still producing today, hundreds of thousands of dollars in profit. Almost 40 years ago. Changed my life. Listen, one dream from God can change your entire life. One direction, one divine appointment, one bit of favor, one bit of wisdom, one bit of supernatural strategy that you hear by the Holy Spirit can literally revolutionize your life, your friend's life, your family's life, your destiny, your everything, your lineage, all that. But you have to stop thinking about the dirt. You've got to stop seeing the dirt. Who are you? I don't, I don't always see as nothing. I have no talent. I have no ability. I have no money. I always see as dirt. Nothing's there. But you have the dirt. Yeah. Sow the seed in the dirt. All by itself, the seed begins to grow. The life is in the seed. You don't have, here's, the, here's, the, here's something to free you up. You don't have to know how God's going to bring that money. You don't have to even have a clue how he's going to do it. He may give you the craziest idea in the world. Peter, you got taxes to pay? Go catch a fish with a coin in its mouth. I mean, he may give you the craziest thought that you've ever had that could become a multi-million dollar business. Just plant the seed. Find a seed that pertains to your need. Receive that seed. I'll end with this story. Many have heard it before. When we were first learning the kingdom, uh, we, we got out of debt. Do you know how that felt? I mean, that was like a dream come true. I mean, to tell you, man, I mean, we pinched ourselves every day. I mean, just to get out of debt was like, uh, you, you know, you get out of debt, you begin to dream dreams again. Right. You have no vision when you're in debt. All you think about is paying the bills. But I always say provision <laughs> is provision. Pro-vision is provision. When I got out of debt, all of a sudden, I couldn't contain all the ideas. Man, I started writing them down. Fast like I write. This idea, you can do this business, you can buy this, you can do this. I said, man, I've never done that before. It's like ideas begin to pop up. So we began to go to churches because we were out of debt. We began to tell people how we got out of debt. We didn't really have all the kingdom understanding yet, but we had enough. And we began to tell people, and you know what? They wanted to hear about it. They were excited about it. Well, how, how'd you do that? Tell me, how's that work? I need to get out of debt, right? So we began to tell people and some churches, we got, you know, met pastors and we tell them, you know, because we were excited, you know, we were excited. I mean, we're excited, yeah. right? Keith, we're excited, man. Yeah. Let me tell you where I came from. I was excited. And they said, you got to come down and tell the church. So we'd go to churches and we'd tell them about debt. We'd have, a, we'd have a big gold pair of scissors. We'd say, okay, repent. Bring your credit cards up here. We're going to cut them up right now. <laughs> no, we did. We did. See, we were teaching them a different system. We did the credit card system. Let me tell you, it's not, it's a trap. Let me just cut them up. It's a trap. You don't want to do that. And so we were at this one church. 
And the pastor said, hey, why don't you come over to the house? The parson, he's right next door. Why don't you have some dessert before you drive back to Columbus? This is down in, down in Albany, maybe a two-hour drive from here, something like that. Sure, we'll have, uh, sounds good to me. So we went over to the house, and his mother's there. She's like 76 or so, something like that. And she had baked these pies, apple pies. They were still warm, pretty good. I said, yeah, I'll take some of that. And uh, so we had a piece of pie with ice cream on it. And she said, I'll have a second one. I mean, a big old piece. She's like, little, little woman, I'll have, I'll have another piece. And she, she could see that I was kind of, really, you know, I was really, this is a big old piece, you know, two big pieces. I thought, wow. She, then she said, oh, she said, I eat all the dessert I can eat. Really? I'd like that. Tell me about it. <laughs> Tell me about it. So she, I eat all the dessert I can. I eat it all the time. I said, she said oh, I, I was a diabetic for 20 years. I couldn't even touch sugar. I'd been in the hospital, had comas, almost died several times. Until one day I read in the Bible that Jesus heals. So I wrote three scriptures, just three scriptures on a piece of paper. And I'd read them every time I ate, you know, food, breakfast, lunch, and supper. I'd read them before I ate my meal. And I thanked God that I was free of diabetes. And she said, in 30 days, I started getting sick. I thought, what's going on? Went to the doctor. He goes, well, stop taking the insulin, he said. You don't have diabetes. It's making you sick taking the insulin. And she was free. And she said, well, ever since then, I ate all the ice cream and pie I can get. Now, okay, what happened? What happened? Tell me what happened. You got to tell me how she did it. Listen, you got to, it's not a nice story. It's a nice story, but you got to be able to duplicate it. How did it happen? She planted the seed, kept it in her spirit. Thank God that she had it because it was his promise. Even though she didn't see it yet, all she saw was dirt. Little by little, it began to change on the inside. And one day it was mature. And when it agreed with heaven, all of a sudden faith was there, which gave heaven the legal jurisdiction. The anointing brought healing to her body and she was set free. Now this is how you do it. The world is so desperate to see God you need to be an example. Isaiah 61 says that God sets you as a planting of the Lord, a display of his righteousness for the display of his splendor. You're a planting of the Lord. He's planting all kinds of occupations. You know what he wants in that occupation? He wants you to be number one. He wants you to shine. He wants you to look different. He wants people to go, wow. You say, well, I couldn't be number one. Why not? Well, I couldn't. Why not? Well, you know, there's a guy, eight, 18 trucks he owns. When I, when I first met you, you didn't have one truck. You were driving for someone else. You are thinking about maybe doing furniture or something. Now he's a multimillionaire, has 18 semis on the road every day. That's in about four years. Because it changed how you thought, and God began to give you those ideas on the inside. You held on to the promise, and it produced. Stand with me tonight. I want to pray over you tonight. <laughs> yeah, the Bible says God can do immeasurably more than all you can ask or think. You know what the hindrance is? What you think. What's the hindrance? What you think. What's the hindrance? What you think. What you think. What you think. What you think. That's the hindrance. You've already pegged yourself in a pecking order of where you think you fit. But I never, I couldn't. Stop it. God wants his kids to be the example. Well, I couldn't. See, stop. Just stop. Make a decision right now. You're not going to say that trash anymore. You're going to agree with what God says. You're going to agree with what God says. What does God say about you? You're the head, not the tail. The lender, not the borrower. That's you. Well, Pastor Gary, I don't think I'm bar. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. Say what God says. See, here's what I tell you. See, you're already prosperous even though you don't see it. Legally, you already have it. Don't say you don't have it. Agree with what God says. Well, thank you, Lord. I thank you for whatever it is you know, I need. Thank you. You know, we, our family is Thank you, Father, I have that. I thank you according to your word. My wife and I came into agreement on that. According to your word, we receive when we pray, Mark eleven twenty four. 24. We have that. We give you thanks for it. Be anxious for nothing but in all things through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be known to God and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. With thanksgiving. Be anxious for nothing. 
through prayer and supplication, the petition. This will change your life. Get the promises out, hold on to them. Don't, in fact, I think you ought to just write this at your bill drawer or somewhere in your refrigerator. Don't look at the dirt. I think you ought to write that down somewhere. Don't look at the dirt. Don't look at the dirt. Look at the seed. Get, look at the packet. Look at the picture on the seed packet. Keep it in front of you. Thank God for it. Lay your hand. Thank you, Lord. We, we had, I just all these stories. We had a couple in our church. They had about, I don't know, five or six kids. And we're learning the kingdom. And one day, the one car blew up. And uh, they had, a, I think, a, a Dodge Caravan or some other car. And uh, within two weeks, they hit a deer and totaled both cars. Had both cars totaled didn't have the cash in their pocket to, you know, to do it. Now, the car that was, it blew up, their, their insurance covered two weeks of a rental car, and they had that. Then the van blew up. So they started driving to church two trips, about 20 miles. They had too many kids for the small car. They'd make two trips. One day, they came up to the church. They had a check in their hand. They said, Pastor, we want you to agree with us for a Honda. What's the Honda van called? Odyssey. Pastor, would, we want you to agree with us for a Honda Odyssey for our family. I said, okay, I'll agree with you. So we agreed. They sowed a seed, counting it done according to Mark eleven twenty four, 24. And they put a big old picture of a Honda Odyssey on their refrigerator. And every single day, they would just lay their hand that, Father, I thank you we have that Honda Odyssey. Thank you that we have that Honda Odyssey. And one day, this lady calls the church and says, Pastor Gary, uh, our family, we just felt led. We want to give a family in your church a Honda Odyssey. <laughs> it wasn't a Buick. It wasn't a Volkswagen. It was a Honda Odyssey. I said, what kind of shape is it in? She said, it's about a year old. It's perfect. Not a scratch on it. I said, bring it on. So we called this woman. Didn't want to tell her. Kind of listen to what she said. I said, how's it going with the car? Believing for the car. Here's what she said. We are one day closer, Pastor. We're one day closer. I said, well, your day's here, sister. Come and pick it up. <laughs> it's a Honda Odyssey. <laughs> Friend, you need to understand the potential you have in the kingdom of God. 